Now, a nine-year-old boy has been killed in an inferno after his stepfather set their home ablaze at Medoma in the Ashanti region. The blaze swept through four rooms in the apartment in which they live, affecting other families. The man, known only as Ajemain, his wife and the twin of the deceased sustained various degrees of injury. Nana Ojima visited the scene and filed this report. The nine-year-old boy, Prince Oti Atta, is said to have shown great potential in drawing. He is described as a bubbly kid. The stepfather is said to have repeatedly assaulted his wife and the twins. Landlord Daniel Opoku narrates what happened the night before the incident. I met his wife. Immediately I entered the house that night. She pleaded with me to speak to her husband about a phone her brother bought for her. I called him and advised him against repeated assaults of the woman. Mr. Opoku says deep into the night he heard a loud cry for help, which caused him to wake up. She told me her husband had fled after starting the fire. He had locked the burglar proof. But I managed to save the woman and the girl. The woman told me the man had wet a blanket with petrol and thrown it on the boy through the window. Firefighters, after extinguishing the fire, recovered the charred body of the victim and deposited it at the morgue. Other families occupying the house managed to escape unhurt, but they lost all their property to the inferno with no hope of a place to pass the night. She says, the noise made me come out and I saw smoke everywhere. All I could do was to pick my son. The cause of the man's action remains unclear. He is receiving treatment at the Konfanochi Teaching Hospital and the police watch. For Joy News, Nanaya Ojima reporting. That's the unfortunate story, let's just say, that made the soul of the nine-year-old boy rest in peace. Nanao himself will join us shortly to give us more details about this particular story, particularly the current state of the culprit, the alleged culprit, um, who is currently receiving treatment at the Confanochi Teaching Hospital, as you heard him say. Um, Nanao is with us. Uh, Nanao, first of all, um, okay, we will have, we will speak to Nanao later in the bulletin. But in the meantime, a Cape Coast High Court will begin hearing the election petition challenging the qualification of the MP for Asin North. The petitioner, Michael Ankoma Nimfa, is in court challenging the MP Joe Jachi Kwesin over his dual citizenship at the time of filing his nominations to contest the 2020 elections. Richard Kojunyako is in court and joins us with more. Richard, what are the issues set down for trial? Well, so the issues have not been set down for trial yet, but what happened is that the substantive case of this dual citizenship involving the MP Fasen or Georgia Chikwesin was dealt with earlier uh, through an interlocutory injunction. And this injunction sought to restrain him from holding himself as a member of parliament. But this particular matter is substantially and materially different from the interlocutory injunction. Same petitioner, Michael Ankuman, in fact, is challenging the qualification of Georgia Chikwesin, the MP for the area. He says that the MP did not qualify at the time he filed his nomination to contest the 2020 election. He relies on Article 94.2a. Amendments.
Right, uh, Richard Kojonyaku there, um, joining us from the central region. He will be giving us a bit more detail um, as he was already. Now, the interesting thing about this story is that the interlocutory injunction which was served on George Achikwesin to prevent him from holding himself as member of parliament was to have taken effect on the 6th of January this year. If you, you would remember, on the 6th of January um, is when Parliament convened initially, the 8th Parliament convened for the first time from the midnight of the 7th to elect the Speaker of Parliament. If George Achikwesi had, Kwesin had not gone to Parliament that day, it is very possible we would have a different Speaker of Parliament. Now, Richard, uh, you were giving us a bit of a background to this case. In doing that, help us understand what becomes of that injunction um, which was served on George Ashikwesin to prevent him from going to Parliament on the night of the 6th of January? Well, so Daniel, uh, that injunction application, the court is now functus officio. Um, that means that the court is now not closed with jurisdiction to invoke or to cite the person for contempt. What it is is that the parties involved in this case would have to come and invoke the proper jurisdiction of the court for this one, citing the MP for the area for violating the court order. And so the app for the court, the court is there, but it is for the parties involved to cite the man for contempt. And that in that case, then the court's jurisdiction would have been properly invoked. Mm. Have we gotten any indication from the leadership of the MPP or Michael Amwakuninfa um, whether or not they would want to invoke the jurisdiction of the court? So as of now, there is no indication today Michael Ankuman Infa himself was in court as well as uh, the lawyers for uh, his lawyers. But uh, the lawyers for the respondent, that is the MP, and then the lawyers for the electoral commission, they were not present in court. This prompted the judge to give certain orders that um, all the parties involved should be present in court on the 25th and the 24th of March. That is the agenda date. Um, the the lawyers are also to bring up their proposed issues so mm. that the issues, the proper issues will be set down for the hearing of the matter. And so that is what has really happened in court. The, the judge indicated that he wants an expeditious trial. And so the parties involved should cooperate so that they can get the, the case done with. OK, so um, everything is on hold till the 25th. Is that the case? For, yes, everything is on hold, but it is not actually on hold because they would have to prepare their issues, then they propose it to the court, then they will agree. So they will iron out the various disagreements and differences, and then it will guide the trial. So when they are coming on the 24th and the 25th, that is where they are expected to bring their proposed issues, then the case will be actually set down for actual trial. Um, you know, the petitioner, Michael Ankuman Ninfa, is basing his claim or his petition on uh, the People's Representation Act, the Constitution, and then the CI 127. He says that at the time the MP filed his nomination to contest, he did not qualify. That claim is being contested by the respondent who said that um, it is not at the time of filing, but at the time the person is being sworn in as a member of parliament. So. We, we guess that the, one of the issues would, would, which would come out would be whether or not um, the MP really, um, the person qualifies to be a member of parliament um, before filing or at the time of filing, or the person qualifies to be a member of parliament at the time of being sworn in as a member of parliament. Richard Kojonyaku, thank you very much for joining us with those updates. Now, former Deputy Energy Minister and Member of Parliament for Karagat, Dr. Mohamed Amin Adam says, Talo Oil has announced a $370 million development drilling campaign to explore our oil reserves. This move is to ensure that government generates more revenue before the fall of oil prices. He also indicates that government is in the process of reviewing contractual agreements with the existing oil companies and also to attract more investors to assist with the exploration of our resources. He was speaking in Parliament in response to concerns from civil society organizations. The energy sector faced unprecedented financial crisis under the NDC government, which could not even support procurement of fuel to operate the power plants. President Akufuado has not only found the means to secure fuel supplies over the last three and a half years, but has also cleared all government debts 
sold to ECG. We have fully redeemed over 1 billion US dollars of debts accrued by John Mahama and the previous NDC government from the bulk oil distribution companies. To sustain cash flow in the energy sector and avoid further accumulation of debts, we are currently implementing the cash waterfall system. We have also provided relevant national infrastructure for the energy sector, including the gas reverse flow project, which now allows us to flow up to 120 million scarf of gas per day from Takurari to Tema, thereby reducing our reliance on Nigeria gas. Ladies and gentlemen, more is being done today. For example, the national hybrid power system which is ongoing at Bui and the Palugu Integrated Project in the north will together increase solar power penetration by 100 megawatts. And more will be done to move Ghana closer to our national renewable energy target in the generation mix. Fellow Ghanaians, when you give us a second term to serve you, we will, inshallah, provide more critical infrastructure for the energy industry, reduce distribution losses, improve reliability in power supply, and increase power and natural gas exports to the sub-region. We will enforce competitive procurement of power projects and minimize excess capacity charges through ongoing negotiations. We will continue to pursue our plan to develop Ghana into a regional petroleum hub in the western region. A bill for the establishment of the Petroleum Hub Corporation is currently under parliamentary consideration. We will even more pursue relevant reforms in the upstream sector and provide incentives for the revival of exploration activities after the COVID-19 pandemic. We'll get more updates on that story later in the bulletin. Now, former Finance Minister Seth Tekbe is cautioning the government to learn to explore other options of raising revenue to develop the country rather than taxation. Though he acknowledges the need to raise revenue as he did in his time in office, he believes there are lessons to learn from his era. He was speaking to me on Prime Morning on Joy Prime TV. If you look at the mid-term mid -term expense or budget framework that is presented in the budget, we are supposed to be reducing deficits. All the adjustments are expectations are on increasing revenues, none on expenditure because expenditure levels are going to be increasing throughout to 2024. I think that it's important for us, as has been said, to also look at, I know it's very difficult because interest payments and Now, Executive Director for Financial Literacy Africa, Dr. Richmond Kwame Frimpon, says it may not be necessary to increase taxes if governments develop more efficient ways to collect the existing taxes. He believes the 2021 budget would visit difficulty on the average Ghanaian. It's, it's painful because I was expecting that in this first year of this second term, where the government had the opportunity to be a little bit more innovative, more bold, more aggressive, to achieve a certain height, particularly in this window of COVID, we are missing that and it's painful. Mm. Let me pick just one item of inefficiency. If we were to share the burden and take responsibility, for example, we could have taken like one of the, the expense size of, side of the, the government machinery and efficiently trim that side. We, we don't see that. We pick things like the tool that we have increasing the levy. We cannot automate it. We say we are, we are doing a lot of digitization, but we don't. If we apply the same digitization, for example, to automating our tokens, and we even make funds available by people paying cash for the year for whichever tool um, lane they are using, 
funds could have been made available to government in advance because if I have to buy a, a tow card and for the whole year, maybe I'm paying 400 cities. As the year begins, I buy it, I pay the government, and it will not even wait for an end of month or an end of year before I get that funding. That becomes innovative. So it's not even about increasing the toll. It's about the efficiency. And if the efficiency is not addressed, even if the levy is increased, the same inefficiency is not going to bring us the mileage that we are looking for with the mm. increase. And so that is where our effort should have gone into that we are missing greatly. Again, look at public debt. There are a number of things that make up the public debt. The off-budget borrowing, the forex management, the budget deficit management, maturing debt and debt servicing. All these things are in the ambit of government. And so if we want to address a problem like um, interest payments, it means we have to tackle our debt management. And if you want to tackle your debt management, the things that make up the public debt are not being managed efficiently. So where do we say we are sharing debt? the burden. I thought that effort would have been led from the government side. And let me say that truthfully, we probably have to embrace ourselves for a, an impending difficulty here because every one of these taxes is going to have a consequential effect on the final consumer. Mm -hmm. Now, on his part, Stabas CEO Isidore Kotufe um, suggested that government appointees take salary cuts to contribute to the development of the nation. Six months ago, we, so we ran a depression in Tema, um with about six buses, you know, transporting workers within the Tema industrial zone. This bus, with these buses, we probably spent about six months, we were spending about um, 30,000 worth of, uh, 30,000 Ghana cities in fuel, in, on fuel. Um, three months ago, this had increased to about 45,000 Ghana cities a month on fuel, on these mm -hmm. eight buses. And, and um, just last month, the invoice that we received was, uh, was about 52,000 cities. Now, with the, with the new increment, <laughs> um, I won't be surprised if within the next, uh, by the time the, the year ends, uh, this, this would really double. To, to, to you know, so this figure then would double. So that's the impact. That's the direct impact, you know, um, on 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 us on our operation. Yeah, there's a price we all have to pay for a better Ghana, isn't it? According to Mr. Foriata. I, I think that then <laughs> government appointees and especially um, the ministers and 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 the likes must be willing to also take the cuts, significant cuts, by the way. Because then that is one of the one of the ways we can we could reduce the impact, you know, the financial impact on, on, on the general population. But then if you still have government enjoying all the benefits that you're enjoying under the uh, I mean the, you know, the current jurisdiction, it's not gonna happen anyway. So then that that, that that this sharing the responsibility then does not become fair or it's not fair. And that is Isidore Potufe. Let's go back to the earlier story from Parliament. And Parker Wilson has joined us to give us a more detail. Parker, first of all, what were these issues that civil society organizations raised, especially in the energy sector? Right, so the issue is about the depletion of our oil reserve, Daniel. Um, the fact that um, on, the, on the global market, uh, people are moving away from a uh, fossil, which is largely the oil reserve that we have here in the country to renewables. And so very soon, our uh, oil reserves will not have any use. Uh, even if it was going to have, of course, the price will definitely decline because people will not be interested in it. And so all the oil companies in this country, including ENI, uh, have indicated or have them notice of their intention uh, to shut down operations if we get to that stage. So the CSOs were saying that before we get to that crisis, because already as a country, we are having serious challenges with revenue mobilization. And one of the ways we generate revenue is from our oil reserves. So before we get into that crisis, government must take steps. And these steps they suggested were to empower GNPC to explore the oil revenues that we have, so that the oil reserves that we have, so that we can quickly generate enough money and invest them in other sectors of the economy. So that was the concern they raised. And this morning, when I had the opportunity to speak to the former deputy minister responsible for energy, Amin Adam, uh, who is now a member of parliament, uh, he said that, well, they admit that very soon uh, we will be in such a situation. 
Um, again, even uh, if you look at our oil reserve, it is almost near depletion. And so steps are being taken. As he speaks, uh, Talo has announced a 270 million uh, Ghana cities uh, drilling campaign to ensure that we explore our oil re uh, uh, reserves quickly. Uh, we start drilling, and that drilling is going to start next month. And um, this is essentially to ensure that we generate revenue and invest them in other sectors. Right. Now, again, he raised the point about contractual agreement between the existing oil company. That it will be important that a government review some of these contractual agreements mm. because already we are moving away from fossil. Mm. And so we'll look at how we can now review the contract so that we will attract more investors into the country to expeditiously drill and explore our oil before we get into the crisis. Parker, has the minority been speaking to this as well? No, not yet. In fact, the, I, I attempted speaking to the chairman of the committee. He said I was, he was getting himself ready. I mean, the, the ranking, he was getting himself ready to review his own document before he can speak on the matter. But because, I mean, Adam has been in the energy ministry for four years and understand the process. In fact, he even cited an agreement they, they wanted to review with Aka Energy, uh, which um, faced some resistance at a time. Right. Uh, he's hoping that this time, uh, when the agreement comes before the House, the CSOs and Parliament right. will all agree for the revision. Right. Now, now Parker, for the sake of our, our, our viewers who may not be aware, um, who are the new leadership of the Energy Committee of Parliament? Uh, well, that, that's the toilet, but for, for now, uh, we know that Atatia is the, uh, Samuel Atatia is the chairman of the uh, Mines and Energy uh, okay. Committee with other members as well because the and, and the ranking member mm. and the ranking member right parker what right, do i have parker wilson on the line hello right parker if you can hear me um i, I just wanted to get the name of the ranking member but um Education Minister Dr. Yawase Duchum, we understand, is expected to appear before the House to answer questions pertaining to the controversial textbook which describes um, um, his the history of Ghana in a certain light. The Education Minister is expected to appear before the House to answer questions regarding the controversial history of Ghana textbooks. Now, the said book and one other have caused public outrage following what the public described as denigrating the ever ethnic group, and falsely denigrating Ghana's first president, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. Um, now, this follows an urgent question filed by the MP for North Tong, Samuel Okujeto Ablaka. Baka, what more do we know about Dr. Educhum's appearance? Well, I'm, I'm struggling to hear, but if you're asking about the uh, controversial textbooks or what people say offensive textbook, uh, which seeks to malign and defame uh, Voltairean. Well, uh, this afternoon, in fact, in the other paper, it's been advertised that the education minister, Dr. Yao Chum, will be appearing before the House to answer questions regarding that. And one of the key issues that have come up is the fact that NACA was, NACA was not going through the process of approving these textbooks, and yet, uh, they were in the market, and students had already uh, gained copies or have had copies of these textbooks. So, uh, even though the minister himself is not in the house, uh, since the other people have advertised, uh, we are expecting that uh, he will be in the house to answer the question. But then, you know, I spoke to the former director general of NACA, uh, which of course is a very good friend, uh, MP for uh, Kwesimi Team, uh, Prince Ama, and then for him, he says there is a, a lacuna. Uh, with regards to the activities and operations of NACA. And um, this is mainly because when publishers flout the regulation, what NACA does, and since he has that experience, is to only caution them. They don't have the powers to reprimand or sanction these individuals, whether to ban the books in the market and, 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 and apply some sanctions on, on these publishers. And so because they caution them, this has contributed to the indiscipline among publishers. Very very well that even mm -hmm. though they send a manuscript to NACA, when they get the books onto the market, NACA has little to do in terms of sanctioning. So he is asking Parliament to quickly initiate a legislation 
and legal backing so that NACA can now, with the powers that they have, sanction and reprimand any publisher who does dread on that tangent so that they bring some level of sanity into the publishing space. Mm. So, so that has been his point uh, right. uh, this morning. Right. Um, thanks, Parker, for those updates, especially from the former um, Director General of NACA, uh, Dr. Prince Hamidou Ama. Now, in a related development, the Ghana Publishers Association has issued a statement apologizing for the distasteful publication. Let me share some details with you. It says here that the Ghana Publishers Association, representing publishers in the country, has been following recent issues in respect of some textbooks published for schools in Ghana. We have observed the history of Ghana Textbook 3, one of such books of the current public concern, and we acknowledge that some aspects of its content are in bad taste. Now, it says over the past few months, the association has been working closely with the National Council for Curriculum and Assessment, which is the state agency responsible for the approval of books for pre-tertiary institutions to ensure that the, protest, the processes for approving the content of textbooks are rigidly enforced. Now, it says since the liberalization or publishing of teaching and learning materials by the Ministry of Education in 1997, Ghanaian publishers um, have consistently provided quality materials for use in schools and by the general public. We assure the Ghanaian public of our continued commitments to publishing TLMs for the promotion of quality education and literacy for national development and unity. Away from that story, some residents of Dansoman are complaining of a sudden spike in water bills. They tell Joy News they used to pay between 300 and 400 Ghana cities a month, but recent bills received have showed um, an over 100% increment. They want authorities to explain the abnormal changes. A couple of weeks ago, the water bill um, that we use in our, our house, it wrote a bill and then I realized that a bill that we used to pay somewhere, sometimes 60 cities or 70 cities, um, had, been, had had about 50% um, adjustment and I could not really phantom. No, we used to pay sometimes 50 or 60 Ghana cities okay. until now, so now the bill came into 120 Ghana cities. If you look at it critically, there's about 100% increment. I see. Yes, yeah, so, and that's outrageous. But I realize that even consumption has reduced, but same, if, if consumption reduces, then perhaps you would agree with me that you should pay lesser. Not mm. so good, mm. but you go there and tell you that's a bill. So, I mean, <laughs> you've got to pay. I think that we have to perhaps maybe monitor it the first, second, third month, because I, I hear in the news that the government has um, extended the uh, free usage yeah. up to, I think, June. June. You have to be afraid of these uh, uh, politicians, but uh, well, that, that is what we are. So uh, for me, I think that um, as a citizen, yes, I need to first of all go to the Ghana Water mm. West Company to let your company, which I have done, but I want to monitor it for the first, second, and third month, and then I can really agree that um, the government has some malice mm. with respect to giving free water to people as opposed to supposedly um, being said during the COVID um, um, era. And I think that this is um, uh, very, very unpalatable to citizens of Ghana. We actually, the, was, the last bill that we were supposed to receive was March before the president came and said, uh, paid the April bill for us free. Before with that bill, normally our average payment is way between, because it's an apartment, a Barcelona apartment, we pay around, it started from 300, 400, that's the average that we pay. By this March one, the bill came 900 and something. We were shop, surprised. So I asked my other guy to go and check what caused the increment. He said there's a leakage in the house. No, 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 we told him, no, no, this is not, a, no, it's not our house at all. The increment is cut across the whole community. It means the whole community has a leakage. Mm. So if you are saying leakage, but there's no leakage in my house. There's no leakage. So if you are talking about leakage, it's the whole community. Everybody's complaining. So it's not like my house at all, that's at this increment that you are telling me is a leakage, and I agree with you. Mm. So we check, there's no leakage. But we also realize from other a community, a, a, what we call it, a landlord. They also complain the same thing. They realize that it's a deliberate attempt to what? To add up maybe the free water you are giving to us, you want to increase it. Then, uh, when we check, then the guy said that, oh, when we complain that there's no leakage, then... 
Now, Director of Public Affairs of the Ghana Water Company, Stanley Marte, has denied any increases in water bills. He joins us on the phone lines. Um, Mr. Marte, are you saying that what these residents of Dansuman are saying is not true? Yes, good morning, Mr. Benedazi. Yes, it can't be true because, one, the GWCL that do not set up types or do not set types, okay, and we go according to the types set for us by the PURC. We can't, under any circumstances, increase types without recourse or without authorization from PURC. So we haven't increased anything and we don't have the authority to do so. So we are using the same types. And what consumers should know is that we build them according to their consumption. And their consumption is determined by us on their meter. Okay, so we read their meters and then we build them. Mm. If anybody is in doubt, you can check the readings on your, on your bill and then just oppose that with the readings on your meter. And then you will realize that you fall within or not. If you do not fall within, then the best is to report to the GWCL. Investigations will be done, and then whatever has to be done will be done. Okay? So if you do the investigation and it is your own consumption, you will pay. If it is not your consumption, but it's according to maybe something is a fault, a, a, a meter fault or something, right. then we'll do the adjustment. But right. if there is a leakage in your house, we are not responsible for the leakage in your house. So if the water is going through the meeting, it's going through the meter, then you will have to pay for it. And that is what consumers know. Now what we realize is that people have still not overcome the free water from last week. Sorry, from last year. So people are still misusing water like they were using they were misusing during the free uh, COVID time. Okay. And we also will have to note that Ghana Water Company Limited didn't give free water. It was government who authorized us to build government instead of billing the customer. So we have sent our bills to government, and government is paying us. Okay? So we haven't given out free water, whereby, because it is over, we have to look for means and uh, uh, other means to recoup that money. No. Government is settling us the bill, because the bill is sent to government. You okay. understand? Okay. So people should diffuse that assertion from their mind. Right. Uh, Mr. Marty, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. You're live on Joy News today. It's time for us to do some business. Daryl Carr will join us very shortly. He will tell us how. A government is saying that we must share the burden. Uh, that's their message to private sector businesses in the wake of additional taxes. It, uh, we, we all have to share the burden, so to speak, to make sure that this nation, this country, does not fall off the cliff. We'll be right back with business. Hi there, welcome to Business. My name is Daryl Kwao. Government continues to defend additional tax measures announced in the 2021 budget, saying they are crucial for the economy. A senior advisor to the Finance Minister, Dr. Samuel Ninoy Ekshong, who addressed a post-budget forum organized by the Ghana National Chamber of Commerce and Industry a while ago, said everyone must share in the burden. So when people go about uh, saying that there's, you know, the we don't need the taxes. Government man give this, government man give that. The reality is that the money is not available. And we must well recognize that. And work within that tightrope so that it, uh, we, we all have to share the burden, so to speak, to make sure that this nation, this country, does not fall off the cliff. So it, it, it may sound gloomy, but it will be for a while. And that is why the budget is calling for everybody on board to do their portion so that this nation can weather the storm. COVID-19 hit us. We didn't invite it. It came on board. We all have to 
embrace it and move forward. Well, the finance minister designate himself, Ken Ofuyata, at a PwC post 2021 budget forum also justified the fresh tax measures outlined in the budget. Government has been criticized about the levies uh, announced in the budget. But speaking at that forum, Mr. Ofuyata insisted the taxes are needed to quickly improve on revenue collection and stabilize the economy in the short term. We all as a people recognize uh, the enormity of the problem that we have, um, certain rigidities. Uh, but um, for us at the ministry, also telling if there are leakages in the petroleum sector OMCs, um, who is it that is doing it? Because you know it more than I do. You know, can we form, um, uh, you know, um, a group to make sure that those things seize, and it's not the responsibility of government, but it's the responsibility of all of us, you know, as a people, you know. So the financial services sector, in like manner, uh, we watched as, you know, uh, people broke the rules. But these associations should be strong enough and have the moral authority um, to begin to say that this affects our bottom line, and let's together, you know, work, work at this. Um, so really, uh, I know there will be issues about efficiencies and et cetera, uh, but we are also, you know, the, the pace at which we are going with digitalization, I think if we have these numbers uh, at the right places, um, then really within two or so odd years, uh, we should be able um, to move our revenue to GDP to the 20% that we want um, because of digitalization, et cetera, et cetera. A fully recovered finance minister designate Ken Ofriata speaking at the PwC post 2021 budget forum. He has been on medical leave in the U.S. following complications from COVID-19. He attributed his recovery to God and prayers from, God, from Ghanaians. Now, some development partners in Africa have commenced a tracking process to check COVID-19 expenditure of some countries on the continent, beginning with Ghana. The Transparency and Accountability Project by Budget Ghana with support from Send Ghana International intends to promote transparency between Afghan governments and their citizens. Here's more in this report. Governments, bilateral and multilateral donors, development banks, philanthropic organizations and the private sector have contributed funds, equipment and expertise to support the country's COVID-19 response. Among other resources, the International Monetary Fund, IMF and the World Bank disbursed $1 billion and $230 million respectively to assist in tackling the pandemic. In tracking the funds, Budget Ghana will undertake major research projects to examine the nation's response to the pandemic with interest in procurement disclosures and data availability, relief packages to both households and businesses, among others. Here is Country Director for Budget, Refifi Inkum. This is not a surprise, given the fallout of between various African governments and their citizens and donors when funds intended for managing the Ebola crisis were alleged to have been mismanaged. Such tendencies may deepen public trust in the government, thus undermining the efforts to overcome the pandemic. To achieve this objective, Budget Ghana will undertake two major research projects to examine the nation's response to the pandemic. This will cover COVID-related expenditure and the procurement processes, support healthcare workers, stimulus to businesses, household support, and the vaccine rollout. Deputy Director at Send Ghana, Dr. Emmanuel Aifa, is urging government to make available all data on expenditure relating to the virus to ensure that the finding of the group is accurate. That's what we think that it's about time we, we partner with government. This is not to find fault anyway, but as, as development partners, we need to look at where the loopholes are and not until we follow the money, not until we track to make sure that yes, this is what government actually intended to use the money for. These are the allocations, these are the disbursements that have come in, where monies are going. If we do not do that, I believe that our civil society will also be doing a great disservice to our country, Ghana, 
and to the people that matter. And so that is what uh, we want. So we are using this opportunity to call on government that yes, send Ghana budget and all our partners. Of course, we'll be coming to government to look for certain information that will help us to closely monitor this. And I believe that we wouldn't just end on monitoring. Once we monitor, as we've been doing over the years, we'll sit down with government, we'll engage government for government to understand what the loopholes are. Concerns about the potential misuse of the COVID-19 funds in developing economies have prompted development partners to take these steps to improve transparency and accountability. And uh, before I wrap up, we've got some news coming in on the never-ending uh, Domelevo saga, if you like. Um, the latest is that the audit service is asking him to pay handing over notes. Here's a copy of the letter which says, uh, we, we refer to the letter from the office of the president regarding your retirement and request you to prepare a comprehensive handing over of the audit service to Johnson Ikuamwa, a CEDU who has been asked to continue to act as Auditor General until the President appoints a substantive Auditor General. We'll be grateful if you could complete the exercise within two weeks of receipt of this letter. So the Audit Service Board asking uh, Daniel Domelevo to hand over notes in two weeks. He's got a response from them, uh, for them, and that's that on your screen. It says, this refers to your letter dated 16th March 2021 on the above matter that is handing over of administration of Audit Service. Your request for a handing over note is preposterous to me because I've been out of office for more than eight months. Furthermore, one, paragraph two of the letter from the office of the president dated 29 June 2020 requested that I hand over all matters relating to the office of the Auditor General to Johnson Ikuamwa, a CEDU who has been in charge since the 1st of July 2020. The letter from the secretary to the president referred to in one above delivered to me after 4 p.m. on June 29, 2020, requested that I started the leave on the 1st of July 2020, contrary to Section 27 of the Labor Act. The section provides that at least 30 days notice shall be given to the worker prior to the commencement of the leave. Number three, the short and unlawful notice from the presidency notwithstanding, I prepared a handing over note and added over to the acting uh, handed over to the acting auditor general on the 30th of june 2020 and he has been in charge for over eight months number four when i resumed work on the 3rd of march 2021 johnson ekuma acedu did not hand over to me with the excuse that the handing over note was not ready and finally after 9 p.m of the 3rd of march 2021 the day i resumed work i received a letter from the secretary to the president requesting that i proceed on retirement all the above notwithstanding, if you so wish, please direct, it, direct the acting Auditor General to hand over to me, and I will thereafter hand over to him. And so that's the latest there. Uh, Daniel Domelevo's response to the Audit Service Board. We see what comes out of that. That's it for business. Post is coming up next. Good afternoon, welcome to Showbiz here on Join News. An American record producer and musician, Mike West, says Ghanaians need more education in the music business. His comment comes on the back of uh, the sector's absence at the Grammys and the conversations it's generated. Well, I think it's good that the conversation has sparked. I think it's good because it's about time that we realise that it's a serious topic. A lot of people don't even understand how Grammy works. Like you have to, there's a process to go through. There's like the, the academy that you have to be a part of. There's submission processes, there's criteria to even just be considered. And it's not like Burner Boy, you know, it was all very, very much planned and calculated. Like Diddy being the executive producer, he's part of the Grammy Academy, all these kind of things. You know, I was part of the um, Grammy Academy when I was working with Beyonce. Meanwhile, Dan Solati Shatawale says his Grammys are his properties. This matter happened. The only thing I see me, ask them where I go, congratulate with Samini, that one, it be no matter. But see, no Ghana artist go for voice because you know what? They the hung. You see when you get money, this thing's not be problem for you. This thing's not be problem for you, bad man. If you work hard when you achieve something, bad man be fire houses man own for his legon. You know be plating. Make nobody take this thing like it be. See, me my Grammys be my properties. Because this industry we did, there is no way 
that they will help they will help push an artist to go Grammys.